So, uh, there will be some little proofs and some uh, uh, algebraic or mathematical uh, discussions in the lecture, but not too much, too much yet. But along the way, we'll be getting deeper and deeper into that. Uh, if, in case you are, uh, you haven't been touching some of the linear algebra's probabilities for a while, it's better to brush up at this point uh, so that uh, uh, you can follow the materials uh, closely. Are we ready to go? Okay, thank you. So let's get started. Uh, today we are going to start discussing representations of uh, graphic models and we are going to start uh, from uh, the first type of uh, graphic model which is the directed graphic model also known as Bayesian network. In fact, the word Bayesian is a little bit misleading because uh, it could uh, uh, have the risk of turning off those non-Bayesians uh, because there is maybe a, in the good old days, there was even a philosophical kind of uh, 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 confrontations between two schools in statistics. Nowadays, we, see, we hear less about that. Modern researchers care less about the ideology, I guess. Uh, but. Uh, uh, I want to make sure graphic models, it not only, they're not only for Bayesians, okay. We use Bayes theorem, you know, in some of, of the inference and derivation, but uh, the Bayesian philosophy doesn't have to be used in graphic models, okay. You can be a frequentist, uh, or you can be a connectionist, or anything, uh, still using graphic model language. It's a very powerful language. In fact, you don't have to be belie in, in, believing in probability. You can still use graphical models, as we said. As long as you believe in that uh, something can be scored with a loss function, then the graph is a good way to help you defining such loss functions structurally. Okay, so that's kind of the, the high level bit. So just to uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, recall, uh, in the, the directed graph models, we have uh, edges uh, connecting nodes, and the edges has, uh, the, have uh, the rationality, and then they intuitively uh, leads to a factorization law, which is uh, a product of uh, a traversal over the graph. And whenever you hit a node, uh, you define either a uh, marginal probability or a conditional probability of that node given the parents, and then you multiply them together. So this graph, this equation basically shows you exactly how that can be done. We're going to discuss undirected graphic models next class, which is a little bit trickier, okay. All right, so one of the uh, the first uh, uh, difficulties people often run into uh, when they get to the graphic model world is notation. In fact, even now, uh, the notations across papers are still very messy. They will never be cleaner because nowadays uh, formalities are even less emphasized than uh, the old school days. Uh, but uh, so I'm going to at least give you a uh, rough outline about the notational structure we use in this class. So we are going to deal with variables and uh, in fact, uh, the variables itself is, uh, you know, a, a very overloaded word. Okay, let's uh, introduce the, uh, the notation V first. Okay, this is a variable, and uh, I capitalize it. Typically, variables are represented by a capitalized uh, English character. And then uh, there are uh, superscripts and subscripts. Let's say I. That means that uh, this variable is multidimensional. And the uh, i means the i's dimension, okay? And, uh, and then sometimes uh, you, uh, am I online? Okay, <laughs> all right. And then, you know, you may see uh, multiple replicas of the random variable. For example, I ask uh, the height uh, of, uh, I ask a description of you, which is a variable. It can be height, it can be weight, it can be, you know, many things. So height is just this i, and weight can be a j, right? And then I ask you and him and her, okay? That means I have a different instances. And if you have to specify, specify that, uh, sometimes people put a superscript there, sometimes with a bracket, sometimes do not, okay? And uh, that basically is, uh, you know, the basic notation. And sometimes, you know, every variable, okay, uh, uh, maybe, uh, how should I say that? Maybe I should uh, collect you, your information in a complex way. One is called uh, uh, your, uh, your body metric, weight, height, and everything, blood pressure and everything. That's a variable. Uh, and the other is uh, your demographics. Okay, you know, uh, where are you born? 
uh, where you're born and uh, you know uh, your education, your income, everything, that's another you know, random variable. They are not other dimensions, but other dimensions, right? And uh, in fact, uh, they could be connected depending on your age and uh, where you live, you know, your income and other things may be associated. That's actually why we, in the future, introduce graphical models to represent this uh, connectivity. Therefore, every variable has, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, a uh, block of uh, uh, kind of uh, characteristics like uh, body metric, demographics, and other things. And then within each of them, there are dimensions. Therefore, sometimes we have, uh, you know, this type of uh, two kind of uh, uh, <laughs> order uh, notations. You could imagine there are, could be three and four and other things. So we are going to discuss that later. Right, so that's typically I, J, K, what they mean, really. Dimensions, uh, you know, uh, in the feature space, sometimes these are called feature space, and these are called uh, the, uh, the index of uh, observations. Okay, so maybe we should just give a name for that. And uh, these are variables. And uh, then sometimes you see a, a lowercase uh, thing for the same variable. Okay, it could be still i, k, and j. And the uh, lowercase usually means that uh, this is uh, a variable with a value already. Okay, it is observed. You actually can't, you know, variable is a placeholder. And then when variable are associated with a value, then it becomes uh, a value of the random variable. And again, for convenience, people still call it a variable, but it is actually not a variable anymore. It is already, you know, uh, with a particular number. Okay, so that's basically a variable value and index. Random variable, you know, very intuitively, the values follows a probabilistic distribution, that's stochastic. Well, random is not literally mean that random. There is, of course, you know, some rules and uh, some characters behind that, but uh, the random is really should be understood as a stochasticity. Okay, they are, they are, they are just uh, changing across different observation intensities. And the uh, random vector, okay, sometimes it's a, a, a capital, uh, in a bold faced and a capitalized uh, character, and uh, which actually could uh, be expanded as a uh, like that. Okay, you basically collectively put uh, you know, all the dimensions together into a vector. And the random matrix is also you know, a capitalized, bold-faced uh, character. And uh, they actually, is, they are a matrix where you could find, for example, i's of one, two, and uh, these of uh, i and k, and so forth. Okay. And you can imagine there are random tensors and the higher dimensional uh, structures and so forth. Okay. So that's a thing we are going to deal with a lot of time you know, uh, in the entire uh, lecture. And uh, particularly comparing to other machine learning lectures, uh, in here uh, the sophistications and the, uh, and the anatomy of uh, the random variables can be particularly rich and also meaningful because we are going to exploit that and also uh, uh, explore it, you know, for various uh, uh, inferential benefits, computational benefits, and so forth. Okay, so that's uh, uh, what I want to uh, uh, tell you ahead of time. Then there is another animal called uh, parameters. Okay, parameters. Uh, if you are a Bayesian, you could say they are. They could also be random variables because you are uncertain about it. But uh, it's uh, convenient uh, uh, to. Uh, kind of a set them aside as a special class. And therefore, their uh, notation also use a different uh, character system, which that the great character characters. For example, uh, imagine you have a Gaussian distribution, uh, which is defined by a mean and a covariance, and uh, you typically see a pair of mu and a sigma, right? And we're going to use things like that, alpha and beta, to characterize the parameters. And again, the parameters can be a Single number can be also, you know, a vector. Typically, we we'll put an error on top of it. It can be a matrix. Okay, so these are just a a, a quick uh, remind about uh, the notational structure. Now let's jump into a problem. I'm going to use a specific use case to start introducing you graphic models and why it's interesting. 
and uh, and then uh, uh, we're going to move from the simple examples to more complex ones. So this has been an example I used for years, but uh, I think it's still quite fun to use it. So when we do graphic models, the first thing you want to remember is that uh, it is a, uh, a tool uh, for you to describe a real world phenomenon. Okay, so here is a real world. Very simple, but it's kind of fun. You go to a casino. Anybody been to Atlantic City or Las Vegas? You probably had that kind of experience, right? You go into a casino, and uh, uh, you were told that uh, there can be some tricks you know, uh, in certain places. One of the tricks they use is uh, they can be two dice, sometimes used by the, by the dealer. Uh, you know, one is a fair die. Uh, we all know what the fair die means. And then the other is a loaded die, which is uh, particularly with the following property. How it's made, I don't know, but uh, it could happen. Uh, basically, uh, phase six has a probability of a half to appear when you roll it. And the other phases uh, are splitting the remaining probabilities, probability mass. And then there's a game. Okay, so you play, he play, and uh, if he got six, you pay him. If you get six, he pay you, and so forth. Okay, so usual thing. So now this is a real world, and uh, now you determine, okay, I'm going to be in this world. Am I going to uh, uh, do something? What things can be done? Okay, uh, let's imagine a story. So here could be a story. You played. Uh, with uh, this guy, this particular very tricky guy, for uh, an hour. And uh, you remembered uh, uh, all the outcomes of uh, his rolling, not yours. Okay, I assume that uh, you want to be offered a uh, fair die, because uh, you know, otherwise there is no point to get you to play, right? But uh, you see the following sequence. What did you see? When you actually line them together, and you remember all these numbers, you may find something fishy, right? Uh, what, 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 what is the fishy part? Yeah, please. A lot of six, yeah, a lot of six, yeah. Uh, why a lot of six from his side, not on my side? You may ask this, right? And then we are mathematicians and uh, computational scientists, right? So we want to you know, uh, you know, uh, refer to facts, and also we want to be rational and uh, make, uh, make a uh, quantitative statement about uh, uh, maybe our suspicions or our conclusions. So here, uh, again, first of all, we determine what question we want to ask. You may ask intuitively, well, this sequence uh, is kind of tricky and fishy, and uh, how probable this sequence can occur if I'm using a fair die? Okay, so that's a fair question. You don't actually know uh, how the loaded die is made, but you definitely know how a fair die is made, it, right? And therefore, you can write the probability of uh, seeing this sequence with uh, uh, entire row to be fair dice. Okay, this is actually known as an evaluation question. You can basically say that uh, what is the probability of uh, you know x? Okay, x meaning these uh, observations. This is a random vector. Okay. And uh, the second question is uh, maybe you want to be a little bit more aggressive and uh, say okay. Uh, the probability tells me that this is very unlikely. Maybe once in a life I'm going to see this, but uh, not today. Right? So uh, you will ask, uh, uh, what might be the place, you know, say this one, is this a normal die, or this is a, a fair die, or a loaded? So you are going to infer maybe a, a portion of the entirety of the sequence uh, in terms of uh, their underlying, uh, you know, uh, dice status, loaded die or fair die. Okay, so that's uh, called a decoding question. You basically want to induce uh, another random variable, maybe y, which is uh, net next to uh, the x, okay, that is uh, giving rise to the observations. And uh, this is, uh, again, we're going to give a name later. This is another random variable because of the choice of dices, okay, is uh, a event that you want to model. And uh, now you are basically asking what is the probability of y given x? That's the decoding question. Okay, and uh, lastly, you you really become a detective, and uh, you want to actually win. Okay, not only that I'm not going to be fooled, but also I want to win over him. Then, what's the first step to do that? I want to actually uh, really determine uh, how loaded his die is, and then I'm going to you know uh, play accordingly. Okay, so uh, that means that uh, what is the probability of uh, you know uh, you know uh, the faces, 
you know, uh, in both the ferro dyes and the loaded dyes. And uh, also, how much is the probability that this uh, guy is uh, switching between the two dyes? Right? So these are the fair questions that a smart person would ask. And this is actually the learning question. Okay. So now you see, you know, you, you've heard about the learning, inference, and uh, evaluation all the time. And uh, when translating to life, this is a particular episode that you can kind of imagine. And likewise, in the future, when you do stock trading, when you do robotic design, you actually could uh, emulate this kind of uh, reasoning style. So now let's do some engineering. Okay, so all the previous slides are, you know, what uh, maybe, you know, a, uh, uh, a amateur or maybe a normal person, a layman can really, uh, uh, you know, uh, come up with. But now you guys need to come up with. We want to start be a little bit more formal. Let's first pick random variables. So we know that there is a sequence that obviously is random variable. So we have an x, okay? And uh, x is actually, you know, a vector, right? With uh, a sequence of observations. But let's just uh, get uh, maybe uh, one of them first, okay? And we define them as a random variable. Again, in the world of graphic models, a random variable is denoted by a node. What are the other random variable I just mentioned? So the observations of a rolling die outcome is a random variable. What is the other random variable? Or are there any other random variables that you want to care about? <laughs> okay. Yeah, probability is not an event, right? It's a uh, description of the event. But what, what, what are the events you care about? Usually we use random variable to denote events. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, he said that uh, it could be the choice of uh, uh, loaded and uh, fair dice. Okay, it's a binary choice. Let's use a zero and a one to denote that, right? Of course, there are many other things. We know which uh, uh, location this particular casino is is a random variable, but you don't care probably. You care less. Okay. So so that's about uh, knowledge engineering. You 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 are you are given the whole universe. And uh, you want to focus on the issue you care about, and of course, you know the rolling outcome is affected by temperatures, you know locations, uh, people's mood, a lot of things. But uh, but again, knowledge engineering means that uh, you need to weed off many of these uh, less relevant things and focus on the thing you care about, right? So let's assume that we only uh, care about these two random variables, and uh, even with these two random variables, you can already say a lot. Obviously, you observe the outcome already of the dice, so this x is actually observed. So it is a special type of random variable. You always get values of that. Let's use a shade to denote that, that uh, phenomenon. You probably are not given the y's in most of the cases unless you are the trainer of, uh, uh, the, uh, of the casino player. Uh, so that's uh, not observed. So sometimes it's called a hidden random variable, right? And uh, then, of course, the value, OK? So x has a value, usually we mathematically use this notation to define a space of uh, this random variable value. What's the space of uh, x? A discrete set, right, of uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. OK? OK. And uh, this one also has uh, a uh, value, you know, binary, right? Of course, you, in, in, the, in the more unfortunate case, he may has many, many dice. <laughs> then that's, of course, a harder to model. It's still modelable, but uh, you need to have more data on the road. Uh, well, I think uh, these are the four major questions you care about to begin with. And then, uh, of course, there are others we can uh, revisit later. Maybe we should start picking the structure. Structure actually is uh, where the story okay, gets interesting, and you do want to make use of that. For example, there are these type of structures you care about. One is a causality. Some phenomenon is caused by some other phenomenon. Maybe you could say that uh, the outcome of the rolling is caused by my choice of uh, the die. Right? Of course, they are caused by other things, temperatures, mood, and everything. But uh, this is maybe the major cause. So how to express that? Well, graphic model tells you that you can use an arrow to intuitively represent that. Okay. 
And uh, it is also sometimes known as a generative. These days we'll talk about the GAN models. That's a particular way of uh, defining a generative model. Uh, but uh, that's actually an important relationship. Okay. Uh, this usually means statistically that you can uh, use uh, you know, a evidence or a value to trigger the simulation of uh, another value okay, when you write down simulators. Uh, but in real world generation, of course, has its intuitive meanings as well. There is another type of structure called coupling. We're going to see it later. For example, two atoms, you know, the chloride and the sodium are next to each other in salt. And are they causing each other anything? Probably not, but they are coupled. And that's a type of coupling we're going to use another uh, way to model. Yeah. Yeah. Can you speak up? It's louder, louder. Uh, I know this is primarily for the question now, but I'm curious Oh, good question. Yeah. A parameter could perfectly also define as a random variable. In fact, uh, but uh, when you define it, then you need to deal it, it as a random variable, meaning that the parameter is changing. Okay. And, and uh, that's totally viable. You can do that. I'm just assuming the simplest case. In fact, I could use a parameter, uh, let's say alpha. Okay which defines the property of a face, right? I could do that. And you could still draw it, it's, it's perfectly legitimate. So you, you, yeah, you have the choice of designing the model the way you want, but then you need to deal with the complexity because uh, if this alpha is introduced as a random variable, then you need to basically define the range of that, you need to define the probability distribution of that, and you need to do modeling of that. In fact, we're going to do it. Okay, we're going to do it later in the class. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, frequent test uh, also could, uh, they don't treat it as a random variable, they treat it as something unknown. <laughs> and then uh, philosophically, they made different things. Unknown means I need to estimate it. And therefore, uh, when given different numbers uh, of observations, you may arrive at a different estimation. And uh, it's still somewhat random. But again, these are just nomenclature differences. Yeah, but uh, yeah, it's a great question. In fact, uh, later in the class, we are going to deal with the case that uh, what if uh, alpha is a random variable? And how are we going to deal with that? But today, for the pedagogical purposes, we are going to assume the simplest case. Okay? Because uh, otherwise, I could introduce even more random variables, you know, a, a lot of other factors, right? So, uh, yeah, so for now, let's, uh, let's uh, remove, okay, I lost my pen. The, okay, he's very happy with your question anyway. Uh, oops. You saw this happen once. Fine, I'm going to uh, restart it. And uh, Okay, great. And uh, lastly, you know, in fact, uh, uh, it's about getting to your question, uh, picking the probability, okay, alpha. What is the value of that? Uh, you know, we need to basically introduce uh, this probability either as an unknown constant or some random variables. And uh, they need to have uh, some kind of uh, a way to be specified. And we're going to actually uh, deal with that question about whether it is a known constant or a random variable using two different approaches and also where these numbers are estimated. Okay, so that's about basically the graphical model. But of course, uh, you, uh, something is missing yet. Anybody tell me why, you know, are we happy with this model already? Are you ready to use it to, uh, uh, to, do, to answer the questions like this already? Or you still feel something missing? Just from a total intuitive storytelling standpoint. So I have uh, yi and xi. And there is an arrow from x, uh, y to x. I'm just guessing, but so before we were able to see the symbols, so you talk about the polyphobic condition. Super, thank you very much. Yeah, the sequentiality and the, the fact that I have a sequence of event is not uh, show up in here yet. So at least, uh, uh, let, let me copy the graph here because I used the space there already. So at least I used to have something like this, i plus one, which is the next step. 
right? And uh, that gets to uh, x i plus 1. Maybe I should also add uh, i plus 2 and uh, x uh, i plus 2 and also something before that and uh, so forth, right? So that's all the random variables at least I need to deal with because that's all my observations or unobserved events. What could be the right structure in there? I think this is a structure that uh, I probably want to assume because uh, I want to assume that every time uh, the way that a dice is generating, uh, the choice is generating an outcome is the same. Okay, that's probably legitimate. What other structure you want to introduce? Yeah, some sort of that's a very interesting uh, kind of uh, assumption, right? Basically, I'm rolling, I'm choosing the dice now, and uh, based on what I choose, should I just uh, choose it randomly that uh, my choice of the dice is independent of the previous one, or I should uh, be dependent? Well, if I'm uh, smart enough, I probably want to be dependent because I don't want to be caught playing you know, a, a, a trick. So I may want to make sure that uh, my, my kind of uh, action is uh, cryptic, right? So it's not like I'm using the, the loaded die all the time. You know, a greedy player probably will do that, but it's very, very foolish, right? Maybe I should even say that uh, maybe among 10% uh, you know, uh, of the time I'm going to choose uh, the loaded, and the other 90% I'm going to choose the, uh, the fair die. That's uh, one way. Or maybe I should say that uh, I should keep using the fair die and occasionally, you know, with a probability choosing the loaded die. And then I'm going to switch back to the fair die. Right? So these are basically different rationales that you can imagine. And the one of these rationale is really such a structure. Every time I choose, you know, a die, it's going to depend on immediately what I did last time. Okay, that's one way. But I want to emphasize this is just a one way, not uh, the only way. For example, you could uh, also have uh, such a knowledge that uh, maybe I'm depending on the previous two choices. That's also fine. So you can see the graph actually gives you this uh, very, very flexible uh, technique of uh, uh, introducing all sorts of uh, assumptions that you care to model. But uh, again, for today's purpose, we're going to only assume a, a single uh, dependence just for the sake of uh, uh, pedagogy, which is this. In fact, what we just did is already building a model that is very famous, known as the hidden Markov model. So why is hidden Markov? First of all, the y's are not observed, they are hidden. And the way the values of the y's are generated is following what is known as a Markovian property. Okay, the future is independent of the past given the present. Okay, it's a first order. In fact, Markov model have many Models have many orders, but uh, what you see here is a first order Markovian model, meaning that uh, the immediate future is independent of the immediate past given the present. Okay, and you can always uh, extrapolate into higher orders. So this is a powerful model we just see. And uh, you have the underlying source, which uh, in the previous case is the simple choice of dice, but it could be a lot more sophisticated and, uh, and uh, compli complicated, such as uh, speech signals. Okay, how do we do lip syncing or lip reading? You probably know there are fancy models out there who can really uh, you know, interpret uh, uh, from afar what you said without hearing you, right? And uh, no, okay, what you said is uh, essentially hidden. And what they observed are basically your, the shape of your mouse. Okay, that's a Markovian model. It could be DNA genomic sequences. Are you in a gene or outside of a gene? Are you in certain structures like promoters and uh, uh, other uh, docking points on the DNA or you are in just the, the junk region in the DNA? Again, depending on where you are, the sequence also can appear differently, right? So this is why uh, hidden Markov model has been very, very widely used in many applications. And uh, again, you know, I'm going to now use this structure to start uh, formulating the questions that I asked. Evaluation, uh, learning, and uh, maybe uh, inference uh, or prediction uh, more formally. And, and also you can see why not a graphic model gives you a great way to do that. So first of all, let's uh, say that uh, we are given two sequence of random variables, x and y. 
Okay, and uh, you will always begin with the joint probability of your entire universe. Okay, your entire universe here is y and x. So therefore, you begin from this uh, gigantic joint distribution. If you have uh, a sequence of a uh, hundred plays, that means you are not dealing with uh, two hundred random variables. Okay, this is already a task that we said in the first class too big for you to express. Okay, in your computer memory, because uh, even if what dealing with uh, binary random variables all over, you are going to have a two to the power of two hundred uh, possible outcomes. Okay, and uh, we have a graphical model now, which we designed that kind of reflects a story that you believe, uh, and also it's maybe not uh, uh, exhaustive in terms of uh, characterizing all possible. Uh, you know, uh, uh, conspiracies and uh, plots behind the scene, but uh, maybe it's kind of in, in, you know, uh, adequate. Then, what's the benefit of using this? Well, the benefit first is that uh, we have a graphic model, and uh, it is a way for you to uh, use the factorization rule to simplify the expression of the joint distribution. So this is uh, what you can do. You walk over this graph. And uh, you use the factorization law to write down a product of uh, marginals and uh, conditionals of nodes given parents. And uh, that's what you are going to get. You can check whether uh, you believe in this or not just by reviewing the factorization law. And then it turns out that uh, in order to express this uh, very big joint probability, all you need are two types of uh, distributions. One is uh, the marginal of uh, the first hidden states. The second is a, a kind of a conditional probability of uh, uh, the x given the y, basically the, the dice outcome given the choice of the die. And the third one is uh, what is known as a transition probability of uh, picking between two dices. Okay. And you can rearrange it as well. And that's uh, usually, you know, uh, you know, uh, kind of trivial. And then, you know, you can, you know, just uh, you know, uh, rearrange and aggregate in whatever you want to get additional insights. For example, this particular insights is telling you that uh, the joint probability of uh, the sequence of outcome and the choices can be expressed by the probability of the sequence of uh, die choices can multiplied by the conditional probability of the sequence of observations given the choices. Kind of intuitive. And then you can also do a very, very uh, formal and uh, simple mathematical uh, uh, operation and uh, write down the marginal probability of uh, P of X, the entire sequence, which actually is uh, the following. You need to do, of course, a lot of uh, summations to marginalize out Y, which is hidden. And then that gives you the probability of X only. So what, I'm, what I was doing was to mathematically answer the question of evaluation already. So this is the joint probability of uh, the entire observations. What is needed here, of course, are these uh, little numbers used uh, you know, in defining the local probability, but we're going to deal with that later. But at least you know mathematically what kind of uh, task you are going to deal with. Aha, uh -huh. good catch. A is uh, P of uh, y i given y i minus one. Okay, basically it's a shorthand for the conditional probability. And why I use a instead of this? And uh, I removed even the notation i because I made already a, a very tricky assumption, which is hopefully reasonable, which is that uh, the transition probability in every step is the same. Therefore, I need to use only one number rather than writing this uh, k times or t times. Uh, it, it may not be true, uh, but uh, again, you know, it's a trade-off between simplicity and uh, you know, operationability, right? Uh, because uh, if uh, you are going to assume that this uh, tricky player is uh, so whimsical that uh, every time he's going to, going to change his strategy, then I declare that uh, with uh, one play, you cannot guess him out. There's, th it, it, there's insufficient of data. And if that trick is not even repeated, then there is no way to learn the whole universe. You have to make some assumptions so that you can learn from the data. Right? So this is called a stationarity assumption. So this model is stationary, that the transition probability isn't changing over time. 
And also you probably see this guy, tau, that's basically my conditional uh, marginal probability of the first uh, hidden event, okay? In fact, this one also can be expressed with another number, uh, which is called the emission we are going to talk about later. Okay, so I already introduced another concept, which is the posterior of the y given x. What is that? This is to give you the answer to the inference question, guessing the hidden sequence given observation. As long as you can compute this value, you are able to answer that. And uh, now the question is that uh, how we are going to learn this, or okay, how we can compute this computation. You probably already see that uh, you know, now we have a way to write down the, uh, the questions, at least uh, in a way that is uh, 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 factorial. But uh, it doesn't mean computationally it is uh, easy. Representation-wise, it's easy now, because you don't have to represent this uh, gigantic table anymore. You can use uh, products of a little uh, you know, uh, you know, matrix or numbers. But uh, in terms of a computation, you see all these summations already. Right? It's a nested uh, set of summations over all possible values a particular random variable can take. How many summations you see in here for a sequence of t lengths? Yeah? Yeah, so it is, a, she said it's a 2 to the power of t. Right, so it is exponential. Uh, you know, anything exponential uh, something you don't want to deal with because uh, that means uh, you, you soon run into an explosion of the complexity. And uh, what we ideally want to uh, deal with a problem is that it is polynomial. So that uh, you either go up the cost linearly or quadratically or maybe in the very unfortunate case uh, cubically, but you never want to go with exponentially, right? So how are we going to achieve that? That's actually one of the major topics called inference you know, in our task. All right, so so much for the, uh, for the story. Uh, 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 what's, okay. Uh, I apologize, this. Uh, I will avoid writing too much down the road. I think it's not very friendly. Okay, so what we saw is a Bayesian network. Just to summarize, it is a joint distribution that constant, you know, uh, that can be compactly expressed in a factorial way. And uh, then what comes next? That uh, what does this uh, factorization and what the graphical topology mean? It actually means a set of uh, conditional independence assumptions. And we we'll we'll talk about the generative uh, nature of uh, uh, the, the operational advantage of that. But now let's focus on what do we mean by the conditional independences. Okay, we saw this already. Uh, we restated the factorization theorem here. And the specification is clear. We need to specify the quantitative aspects and the qualitative aspects. The qualitative ones are the graphic topology. The quantitative ones are the numbers associated with this conditional distribution. So this is just a review about what we just did. And uh, where do we get the quantification, uh, the qualitative specification, the structures? Well, just now, it came from our assumption, right? So we make assumptions about the universe and we articulate and then uh, document such a story using the graph. And uh, they could be causal relationship, could be modular relationship, and so forth. It could be assumptions from uh, assessment from experts. But uh, one topic we're going to uh, spend a lot of time on down the road is that uh, how to so-called uh, objectively learn such structure from data. Uh, we're going to see how that can be done in certain cases. And sometimes it's just uh, you know a certain architecture that we like. For example, uh, in the world of a deep neural network, there are a lot of structures out there and uh, sometimes it's just because of a uh, taste. Okay, people like it, and it also generates some good effects, and that's no, nothing wrong with that. Okay, so now uh, go back to the more formal side of this. So we have a graphic model here. What does all this edge mean, other than guiding you into a factorization, a factorizable definition of the joint distribution? Well, they actually do have a probabilistic definition or meaning, which is known as uh, independences. And let's look at uh, the three major building blocks of uh, basic structures you know, in the whole graphic model you will see all the time. 
So this is a structure we see all the time, right? Which is a common parent, you know, uh, uh, pointing to a number of children. For example, you saw it in here, right? In here, and uh, it actually also leads to a probabilistic property that can be formally expressed, meaning that, uh, you know, uh, fixing B is going to whenever you see this structure, you actually get a following property, which is that uh, A is uh, independent of C given B. Okay, so this is an important structure, which means that uh, if you write down a joint probability of uh, A and C given B, because of this, this whole thing can naturally factor into this. Okay, that structure automatically entails this property. And we can prove it. In fact, we're going to prove it in the next slides. The next structure, such as uh, this one, is uh, known as a cascading structure. You know, uh, you know a, a chain of random variables connected by direct edges. And uh, that entails another type of uh, conditional independence. It's known as uh, the middle is uh, decoupling the future from the past. We saw that in the hidden Markov model story already. Right. Again, you can write down a, uh, you know, a expression using joint probability and the way they factorize. The third one is a little bit trickier. Uh, where do we find it? In fact, oh yeah, it's here. Right. So uh, this is called the V structure. That is particularly intriguing. So here, usually we say, given something, other things become decoupled, right? But in here, uh, we have a opposite story. Uh, it says that. Uh, Originally, A and B are, uh, are, you know, are not coupled. But then once you saw a uh, shared kind of descendant from two nodes, suddenly become, they become coupled. So that's uh, uh, a, uh, a very, very uh, inter interesting uh, dependency structure known as uh, you know, uh, the V structure or the so-called explain away structure. Okay. Uh, okay, maybe uh, let me use an example uh, to give you maybe a more intuitive uh, uh, insight into why this is interesting and why this uh, phenomenon uh, needs to be modeled. Uh, so at the beginning of this class, you probably noticed that I was here a little bit late, right? And there's a clock there. You actually could determine that uh, 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 it, is, uh, it is late. Uh, let's say uh, there may be uh, two events in the universe that uh, uh, you know, could contribute to this. Uh, one is that the, this clock uh, may be uh, not functioning well. Okay, it's an event. A clock is working well or not in this room. Another thing, imagine that I'm driving from my home to the classroom and there is a traffic jam, say, on the road. So these two events. A traffic jam on the road from my home to CMU campus and a clock not running well. These two events are they dependent? They are not, right? Without a story, they are not dependent. But then there is a story. I am here on time or not. That's a binary event. And uh, they could be caused by uh, the clock being right or wrong. Because uh, if the clock is uh, not uh, on time, then maybe I am on time, but the clock is just not telling you the truth, right? And the other thing could be that, uh, well, there is a traffic jam calling me, uh, causing me to be, uh, be, 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 uh, be delayed. Uh, now that uh, you see me here, uh, not on time, okay, you saw that, that effect already. And additionally, you also learned that this clock uh, is actually slower. Okay, it's not right. Okay, now you could also observe that uh, this clock is perfectly on time. Uh, you reference to your own watch. Depending on this observation, what's your estimation about the traffic uh, situation? Did you see the point? Okay, it's kind of a tricky point. If the clock is uh, perfectly fine, then the probability of uh, having a traffic jam on the road is larger. But if the, prob if the clock is actually running slow, then the probability of having a traffic jam is actually uh, also lower, right? So these are uh, two events, two irrelevant events suddenly become coupled just because uh, they jointly cause a third event, which is uh, my presence in here on time or not. 
Okay, so this is a very, very interesting uh, probabilistic uh, dependency structure that people do want to model. It actually reflects you something less than trivial, you know, like the first two in terms of uh, how events can be coupled. And why we call them explain away? Because uh, this uh, clock thing, okay, is uh, explaining away, you know, some of the, you know, probabilities uh, we could attribute to uh, the traffic jams and so forth. Okay. And of course, they can be still, you know, for example, originally we have a P of uh, uh, A and B to be not decoupable. Uh, actually, uh, decoupled, you know, it to actually, originally is this without a C, but the given C, suddenly you cannot uh, write them down into a product of uh, two conditionals. Right, so that's kind of how you mathematically express that. All right, do we need a proof for one of these? Do you mind to see it? Do I have it? Okay. Um, okay, so somehow this uh, notation is sticky across the, uh, the slides, which uh, is discouraging me from writing more, I guess. Hmm, that's annoying. I will write one more, and then we're going to stop using the pen, okay? So uh, how to justify you know, uh, a, uh, a, a statement that uh, this uh, graph uh, fickle structure entails you know, a uh, probabilistic uh, independence uh, property in the distribution? So uh, here we say that uh, this graph is uh, telling you that uh, as a uh, joint distribution A and C given B, you know, uh, this particular motif entails the following conditional independence. Right, so A, C given B entails this. Right, so that's basically our target. We want to prove that. And why this is true? Okay, let's just blindly follow the factorization rule and see why this is automatically true. So according to the factorization rule, we are going to write down the joint of A, B, and C using the, the factorization, which is, can you help me to write that down? This equals to what? We traverse the graph, right? And the first graph we write, the node we write into could be B. Right? And then multiply to what? Please speak out. A given B, thank you. And? Great. Okay, that's basically by definition, we're going to write this way uh, for factorization. And then the conditional of uh, A and C given B equals to what? P of uh, A, B, and C divided by P of B. That's by definition, right? And uh, then you just introduce this into that, you get what? Very, very trivially, this one cancels this one, and then you get P of A given B and P of C. So very trivial, right? This is trivial, but imagine that you have a large graph with a few hundred random variables, and doing all this kind of proof is rather painful. But you don't have to do it, because you can literally read all these statements, okay, off the graph just by inspecting that. That's actually very, very nice. Or if you already know these statements, you can draw the graph to incorporate that also very trivially without uh, crafting the distributions in a certain way. Okay. Oh, thankfully it doesn't stick. Great. So this is getting you the concept of IMAP. Basically for every distribution that you define on a domain X with random variables, you can always define you know, a uh, set of I to be the set of independence assertions that uh, you know, like you know, of the form of this that is hold in P. Okay, that's basically you know, 
uh, you know, a, the, the intrinsic nature of a structured distribution. And uh, the how to get there, right, uh, we are going to talk about it. But uh, let's first say uh, how this I stack look like, uh, this I uh, map look like. Well, again, every independence or every set of uh, independences can be associated with a graph object. And here let's uh, call K, you know, uh, uh, to be uh, a graph object that is uh, associated with, uh, you know, uh, this. And we say K is the I map of, uh, you know, a, a set of independence. Okay, so imagine that uh, K is a graph and uh, using the rules I just mentioned, this uh, V shape, this uh, cascading shape, or this uh, common pairing shape, we can always come up with this uh, I of K. And then we have another set I, which is uh, whatever other given set of random uh, dependencies or independencies, you know, for the same set of random variable. If I K is a subset of I, then we say that uh, K is uh, a I map, okay, of that. And where does this I may correspond to? Well, this I may be corresponding to a unknown distribution P, okay, defined over the same X. Then we suddenly established, uh, you know, a uh, a graph with a uh, probability distribution. We basically say that, uh, you know, uh, this graph G, okay, if uh, I of G is a subset of uh, I of P, then G is uh, a I map of a distribution. Okay. So look at the the, the, the the transitive nature of my definition. Originally, I define a I map of a graph, okay, a, a graph being an I map to a set of independent distribution, uh, independent statements. And then I extend that to make I or make G a graph to be the I map of a distribution because a distribution can define a set of independences. Okay. And uh, there are some facts uh, about this uh, I map which is kind of interesting. Uh, for example, uh, If uh, G is a I map of P, that intuitively suggests that uh, either P, you know, encodes exactly the same set of uh, independences uh, in G, or maybe something more, right? And uh, maybe, uh, okay, let's uh, look at a real example to hopefully appreciate uh, what those situations can happen. For example, here I have a, a graph, a three graphs. Uh, here is a graph. What is the the I set of the first graph? Again, an I set is nothing but a collection of independence statements between random variables. So, what's the I set of the first graph? X independent of Y, right? Great. And uh, what is the uh, the 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 I uh, the G uh, I G of the second graph? So we are talking about graph only right now, no distribution yet. Okay. For any graph, we can have a I of a I of graph. It's an empty set. It's an empty set. Thank you because uh, there is no way to claim any independences between the two random variables. And the third one, empty set again, okay? Okay, so now let's say we are not given distributions. Okay, so here are a distribution. Uh, so these are two distributions actually. And uh, did you see something interesting from the first distribution? This is a joint distribution of two random variables two binary random variables. Okay, so I have a P. Did you see something interesting of this IP? Yeah, you probably noticed that uh, you could almost infer from here that uh, X and the Y are independent. Okay, so a distribution on two random variable can be arbitrary, like the second one is another distribution on the same random set of random variable, but the first one has a hidden independence clause in there 
and you can inspect it and derive it. Sometimes if you have a big table for you, getting this kind of thing from a table of numbers will be very hard. Okay, but uh, such a IP exists. Now, I ask which of this uh, graph is a uh, IMAP of uh, this distribution P1? All of them? Okay. The first one has uh, an independence, and the second one is also having an independence. So true, they are equivalent, right? Or the, the, this graph. And the, the other two, they still basically are having this uh, enclosure property. They are a subset of this. Empty set is a subset of this. Right? But uh, what's coming here is uh, the second one. So. What is this? What is the I of P2? Empty sets, right? Because they are dependent. Then, what's the, which graph is uh, a IMAP of this distribution? I'm playing a word of game, but uh, a game of word, but it kind of tells you how to establish the relation between a graph and the distribution. Yeah. The middle one. How about the last one? And the last one. <laughs> and the last one yes, because uh, these two graphs assume no independences, and uh, here there are no independences. Therefore, they are equivalent in terms of the independence set. But uh, the first one has a independence statement inside which does not exist in here, therefore it is not a IMAP okay, of the distribution. Again, this uh, game of words is kind of awkward, but uh, I want you to think now about the relationship between a graph and a distribution, how they actually can you know, cross, uh, refer to each other, and uh, maybe even establish a equivalence. And that's very important because uh, in the end, you will be worried about uniqueness. Given a graph, can I write one distribution or multiple? Or given a distribution, can I express them with uh, multiple graphs and uh, or one? Uh, why this is so interesting? Uh, just to tell maybe a side story. Nowadays, people are talking about the explainable AI and uh, explainability everywhere and so forth. Or explainability really is only meaningful if you have uh, a uh, single or uh, absolute e explanation. If uh, two explanations are equally likely, then it's less useful, right? So now, if there are no uniqueness between you know, a uh, graph versus the probabilistic dependencies between, behind it, you need to question basically whether some models that you learn from data, which uh, can be expressed as a graph, offers your explanation or not. Right? So that's basically a longer story I'm going to touch upon in the future. All right, so uh, I think uh, uh, I'm going to run a bit faster. Uh, we know about uh, uh, you know, uh, I set already, and uh, it is uh, basically capturing interesting statistical independences in the graph, and there are multiple ways to systematically extract that. Okay, because just now what we use is what is known as the local kind of uh, independences. We're talking about the triplets of nodes that is connected in a certain way. And here are some more formal definitions of that we are going to skip. I'm going to now tell you a uh, law which allows you to systematically extract all independences in the bigger graph, okay, uh, uh, you know, uh, with uh, you know, a, a set of uh, uh, very uh, standardized rule. Rarely people do that in practice, but uh, the prov provable uh, feasibility of doing that is important because that means that uh, in a graph, you can get definitively a set of independences. And then you can establish uh, the possible equivalence between the graph and the probability defined on the same set of random variables. So this uh, law is known as the graph separa separation criterion, known as a D separation. If a set of nodes are not next to each other, but kind of uh, distributed over the entire bigger graph, how to determine their independence relationship. So here, maybe we use these three nodes as example, X and the Y and the Z, and uh, connected in the graphic model. 
so originally this graph uh, is uh, you know uh, showing you that uh, z is uh, uh, you know somehow in the middle but you actually don't know uh, whether z is uh, causing x and y to be independent at least not very easily so there's a simple rule allowing to inspect this graph and determine whether they are really causing the independences, which is known as uh, uh, separation in a moralized graph. So again, this is the procedure. First of all, the original graph can be very hairy, hanging not in the nodes. We're going to now focus only on the nodes of interest, okay, the query nodes, plus some other coupled ones, which is known as the ancestral graph. So the node itself, plus uh, any nodes that is uh, an ancestor of uh, the nodes in question. Okay, so here this guy gets removed because it is not an ancestor. Okay, and then this is still a direct graph. We're going to do a manipulation which is called the moralization. Again, in the in the good definition, in the older uh, uh, word of uh, marriage, uh, people uh, thought that if you uh, you know uh, uh, you know produce a children between two people, you declare them to be coupled. Otherwise, it's immoral, at least uh, uh, in a certain universe. So this graph gets uh, now transformed into what is called a moralized ancestor graph, which uh, removes the connectivities between nodes, but uh, connects uh, those uh, uh, parental nodes that are shared by a, a single children, a child. Okay. So this node. So we have now this new graph derived from the original graph. And uh, now if you see in this graph, there is a way to travel from uh, one node to the other node using any path in that graph. Then you basically say that uh, these two nodes are dependent and not independent. Okay. So basically, you know, now the independence are only honored in this way. If no, x and y are independent, okay, given z. If, uh, you know, uh, z de-separates x and y in the moralized graph, we're going to basically get a, such thing as a set. Okay, so that's basically in a way to uh, obtain all the independences in the graph using a, uh, a procedure. You can actually digest this uh, a little bit more down the road and uh, back, back home to see how this uh, very interesting rule is capturing all the uh, three little motifs I just uh, mentioned, cascading common parents and the V structure in a single uh, you know, operation. In fact, there is another, yeah. Mm -hmm. I remove the ancestors of every node in question. I'm not, not remove the ancestor. I remove. I keep the ancestor of every node in the question. Sorry, I remove other things that are not ancestors. Yeah. So here I'm just telling you an operation. Okay, basically, literally just do three steps. You know, uh, starting from the original graph keep the only ancestral graph, and then remove all the directionality, and connect the common parents. That's it. And then I guarantee you, magically, after you do this, and then use the de-separation rule, you're getting, going to get all the independences on the graph. Okay. So that's basically you know, a, a, a mechanical, operational way of uh, extracting all the independences between random variables, between any uh, triplets of random variables. In the inner graph, or triplet sets of triplets of random variable sets. That's also for example in here, x could be a set, and the y and the z could be also a set, and that gives you a richer definition of uh, independences between arbitrary subsets. Uh, I have another uh, law called the uh, baseball, which is also helping you to uh, get the i i of j, uh, but but because of the interest of time, I'm going to skip that. And uh, you can either read it from Michael Jordan's book, or uh, our TAs could uh, uh, tell you in, in the recitation. It's kind of an interesting thing, whether a ball you know, from the source can be passed to the destination, you know, uh, given 
some blocker in the middle, you know, using three rules. One is a passage and a cascading common parents and uh, shared uh, children on this structure. But uh, we're going to leave it as uh, maybe a homework or as a, a uh, offline topic. And there are also uh, ways to use it to do this expression. And again, I'm going to leave that as a homework. Okay. Sorry for the interest. Uh, for the interest time, I want to move on to a few more other interesting topics. One interesting topic I want to establish, I want to actually uh, uh, discuss a little bit, not to complete it, is uh, to now really uh, tie all the materials I mentioned about the IG and the IP together to formally establish a uh, equivalence. Okay, and also we need to actually even ask does the equivalence even exist or if it does, how to prove it. So the equivalence is uh, talking about uh, the following uh, uh, two uh, approach uh, of uh, uh, coming up with distribution. Okay, let's say given the graph, on the one hand, we can uh, define this uh, IG and then come up with uh, a P that uh, satisfies all the I's in the IG. Okay, so let's imagine operationally how can you do that? How to get IG given a G? How to do that? At least uh, operationally you can do it, right? We just have a deseparation law which can be turned into a program. You just scan the graph in such a way and then you can get all the I's in the IG. But uh, then from this uh, IG to a P of uh, IG, how do you do that? Given a set of independences, and then you write down a joint distribution of uh, all the nodes in the G that satisfies all the IG. Does anybody know how to do that? Uh, Factorize is the second way. That's a, yeah, that's a tricky way. It's a, it's, you know, when you do factorization, you don't need to know IG at all. You just blindly follow all the graph structure and write a, a, a that's actually the, 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 the very good way. Uh, but I'm trying to also, you know, give you a more principled way that is uh, coming from first principle. I know the IGs already and uh, I follow all the IGs and the define the P, uh, not as a byproduct but as a direct kind of uh, vehicle. Do, do anybody know how to do that? If I knew, for example, X and is independent of Y and I want to write down a P of X and why, how do I do that? Yeah, I need to kind of craft in the numbers so that when they multiply, uh, they actually uh, could, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, still uh, keep the independence properties, right? But when we have a conditional independence and all that, when you have many random variables, this can be very tricky because, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, things can, coupled in, can be coupled in a complex way, right? Basically, it is a uh, constructive uh, kind of uh, 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 symbolic, maybe uh, imaginary process that uh, you write down a distribution, you examine whether it satisfies your independences. If not, you disqualify it and you keep those which qualifies, which is uh, maybe uh, conceptually possible, but in practice, I don't see anybody do that. Right. The second way is to really follow yeah, what you said, the factorization rule, even not worrying about all this IG. But the magically, we could uh, establish that uh, these two ways gets you the same distribution. Okay, so that's actually very, very, very good. And that's why we actually want the second way because uh, you know, the graph defines the independences and then using a factorization law like this, you automatically get a distribution that satisfies all these distribution, uh, these, these independences. And also, hopefully uniquely, and that actually gives you a, a rationale behind the probabilistic model. Okay, so, um, here are some examples about how that can be done in terms of the factorization. We're going to pass that. Remember, the random variables can be discrete, which uh, follows uh, such a uh, conditional dependence, a conditional probability table. In fact, it also can be continuous. What if uh, you know one of the random variable is a Gaussian distribution, or all of them are Gaussian are, 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 are continuous numbers? Then you can also introduce. Uh, you know, Gaussians or conditional Gaussians to define the conditional 
I know we can use other things as well, but here are just some simple examples. So the key question here now is that uh, are, you, are you already all comfortable that this is going to get uh, uh, a uh, no leakage uh, definition of the distribution? For example, do you want to know are there other independences for and that is hold for every distribution of a P that factorizes over G. So I write down a distribution that factorizes over G. And G also defines a set of independences just by the D separation. And I claim that they are equivalent. Are you convinced already? <laughs> it's kind of a leap of faith still needed, right? So we haven't even really proved it yet, right? So uh, here is basically the question. So people do ask the soundness and completeness of uh, this separation. Soundness basically means that uh, if I have a uh, distribution of P that factorizes over G, then uh, all the dependence independences in the P, in the G is going to be a subset of uh, of uh, of P. Okay, that's actually a uh, you know a uh, provable trivial. Because uh, you know every independence, you know when, when you actually, uh, you know, uh, uh, basically, you know, uh, look at all these independences, you know, in the graph, uh, and uh, you know uh, they will all be captured, you know, in the P if you write down the factorization. That's actually uh, quite trivial to prove. You can always, uh, re you know, introduce these uh, local laws that. Uh, tells you how to factorize distribution, and you will actually find that they are all honored in the factorization rule. We actually we have a proof just now showing you that when you write down P of A, B, C, following the factorization, they actually captures this V structure already. You can actually use the same technique to prove likewise. The harder proof is actually the second part, the completeness. For example, uh, if uh, we have a distribution P that factorizes like this, Do they uh, have uh, maybe the other way to uh, do, do we basic? Do they actually uh, have uh, no more independences in the G? Okay, that's actually a harder proof that we haven't established yet. What do you think? We have a few minutes left. I want to uh, make give you a chance to to. Uh, I don't quite understand your question. What I'm asking is that uh, you write a P now using factorization, okay? And, uh, and that, that distribution according to factorization has uh, also a set of independences. I'm asking, are there any more, uh, more independences in this P that is not captured in the graph? Could be why. Okay, I, at least the, <laughs> I can see that you guys are suspicious, right? I, 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 it's a it's a right question to ask. Uh, the intuition is kind of there already. Uh, this uh, statement uh, could be leaky, right? In fact, uh, here I have a, uh, maybe a better way to state that. We use a contrapositive statement about the completeness, which is that, uh, say, suppose in a graph, one thing we can make sure that there is a mechanical way of uh, defining or finding, uh, you know, uh, x and y are not de-separated given z. That's, that's definitely definable, right? And meaning that uh, they are not independent of each other, at least from the graph definition. And uh, then they must be dependent, you know, in all distribution of factors over G. We want to say whether these are true or not. Because if they are not de-separated, that means they are dependent, right? And then when we write the G, ignoring the I of G, but uh, only factorize over G, are they guaranteed to be dependent or not independent? Right. 
<laughs> it's very confusing, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess like he can he can not separate it, and there's like any model any possible distribution. Is that conditional distribution? Yeah, I think this deserves a homework question, isn't it? <laughs> right. I'm going to give you some tricks. First of all, this uh, contrapositive statement is going to make things a little bit easier. Instead of uh, directly stating this, whether there are extra, you know, uh, independences, uh, you know, in the P, we're going to basically, you know, come up with a counter statement. If things are independent here already, are they dependent in the other side? Which actually is the, you know, uh, complement of that statement. And uh, without uh, too much explanation, if you are curious, you can inspect this graph, which tells you the equivalence, you know, of uh, the contrapositive statement and the original statement. And then with that, you can start to prove with a counterexample. Okay, and here I give you hints of such a counterexample. In a sense, you can engineer, okay, some distributions, okay, which uh, you hard code a independence, okay. Usually, you know, uh, detecting independence is uh, require you only one instance, right? If uh, you have a table like this which is independent, then it basically this distribution has independence. Then you basically say that okay, in the original graph, they are not separated; they are dependent. But uh, as a result of me constructing this uh, local dependence table in the fashion rule, I hardwired some independences there by playing with these numbers. I suddenly make them independent. Then, okay, your statement is false. So that's the kind of a trick people could use to uh, disprove that. But also it gives you kind of a, you know, a insight, you know, only when such a violation is happening. Only when you actually make this kind of uh, uh, special cases that will happen. Otherwise, you can no, you have no way to introduce any new independences. Right? So that's the rationale behind uh, this uh, proof. Maybe uh, you should try, you know, uh, do that in a homework. I'm going to tell the TA to make that uh, for you to maybe, uh, you know, uh, win a few points. Anyway, I'm going to stop here. The statement is uh, a theorem that is uh, not totally satisfactory, but uh, almost adequate. It says that uh, for almost all the distribution P that factorizes over G, you know, you have uh, this equivalence, except for some special treatment, such as this uh, zero one, uh, you know, parameterization, a measure zero parameterization, where you hard code certain independence, you know, in your table. Okay. So I think that uh, I'm going to uh, hit a pause. And there are a few other slices which gives you a little bit additional uh, statements and examples that I may go over very quickly in the beginning of next lecture. But I do want you to at least uh, uh, go home, review the slides, and digest what is uh, the independences on G, what is the independence on P, and uh, how come they are equivalent, or why they can be in equivalent in certain examples. Okay, thank you very much.